Dr. McGill, um, yo, I'm <laughs> super pumped right now. <laughs> and there's so many things I wrote down. I, I got just, some wood myself over here. <laughs> so, Dude, God. Um, <laughs> but I think the first thing that I want to kind of see if we can understand a little bit is because when you mentioned the densifying of neural drive and you mentioned that a lot of these top level athletes to achieve these crazy levels of strength or crazy feats of athleticism, they go to a dark place. I know a lot of powerlifters or a lot of people were thinking, oh, okay, so just get really angry, think of some trauma or so just like think of something really dark to help me get this lift. Um, but I, I want to know from you, from what you've seen, how can you see this applied? Because when I personally think of that dark place, I, tr I when I did powerlifting or when I was focused on that, I tried the whole getting pumped and angry thing or whatever, didn't work for me. The best thing that worked for me personally in terms of that dark place was going to a place of no emotion at all. And when I was able to like, just everything was empty, I was able to just boom, like things worked well. And I find that with martial arts too. If I don't think, and if I just like zone in and I'm, I'm emotionless, and I think I'm, I'm thinking of the emotionless thing because you mentioned you could kill a person. Now I'm not saying I would kill a person, but when I do that, it's like, I get what you're saying. So I want to know for, for lifters who want to tap into this or get to a point where they can maybe try to tap into that. What does that even look like? I should run upstairs and get my wife, who's a sports psychologist. So uh, you use the magic word, getting in the zone. And for someone to get in the zone, they need such a command of what it is they need to do. If a game player has to watch the game evolve, uh, that's partly inherent, of course, but mm -hmm. it's also the practice and the years that they've put into this. Uh, then they express what we call engrams or what a coach might call muscle memory. And they have such a bank of uh, muscle memories or engrams that they can call upon those and flow in the zone. And, uh, you know, I just know myself, someone asked me the other day, um, something about quality of lecturing. And I said, well, you know, I, I think I've maybe done one good lecture in my life where I was in the zone absolutely completely. I was lost. It flowed. And then when I went back to think about it, I couldn't. It wasn't anywhere in there. But then when I, someone had made a video of it. And I said, damn, that's a good lecture. <laughs> but it, I was totally in the zone. And as you know, you, you, you get in there. Uh, now, how do you get there is what uh, eludes a lot of people. And again, I can just offer some examples. You know, there are the head bangers and the guys who get slapped and sniff uh, ammonias and all this kind of stuff before they go onto a powerlifting platform. But then you, you go back to a guy like Kaz. Again, he would use quite a bit of Russian dictum. Fat tongue, lean back. You'll see this w with the Eastern Europeans when they approach the platform, and well, many Americans too. They lean back and they let the tongue fall to the back of the throat. So, uh, and Sima, your description of emotionless relaxation is very much a Russian take technique. That's the beginning of it, the fat tongue. Relax, let your arms waver and then start to organize the engrams in your brain of what you're going to have to execute. And then Kaz would then go into, you could see it. He would get goosebumps. The sweat would start to come off his brow. He wasn't using foul language or swearing or banging his head against the wall. That was someone else's gig. But it was the way he got to that dark place to create the densification. So different strokes for different folks. It mm. sounds to me as though you're more in the, the CAS camp. And When it comes to strength, I know there's some commonalities. You mentioned it very briefly about grip. Um, what What is it about grip and what is it about, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, I think a lot of the neural drive can also come from like neck strength as well. Uh, if there is a connection, what what is the connection between the grip? Like why do you think the grip and the neck strength, like if you're just to test someone who's, you know, if, if you have a group of 50 people and you test people out, someone's got a stronger grip and a stronger neck, 
they most likely are going to be the strongest person in the group when you have them demonstrate a bunch of different uh, types of, of, of lifts and things like that, depending on whether they've done them before or not, obviously. But what is the connection between the grip and the neck? Uh, I don't know how eloquent I can be about it, except to describe the techniques to make it work. Because I've measured the techniques, I haven't done the full investigations as to what the mechanisms mm. are. So I think uh, there's a lot of neurology that I can't explain, except you inhibit the inhibitors. And getting your body tight. So think of the number of sports where you'll hear the coach. It could be gymnastics. It could be the last uh, quarter mile of a marathon even. Don't break form. Stay tight. You know, these kind of uh, mental images to keep stability and control where the body needs it so you don't, so you keep inhibiting the inhibitors. And uh, grip strength is a huge one. So if you just take a take your arm at its side, uh, and Sima, and and Mark, you put your hand over the deltoid of Ensima's right shoulder. Let's do it now, Ensima. Yes. Now just feel what goes on in the shoulder. Ensima, don't activate your shoulder. Okay. What I simply want you to do is, in your hand, start to squeeze. And keep squeezing. Now go to the dark place and squeeze your hand now because you're going to commit murder. What just went on in the shoulder, Mark? Yeah, I felt the entire shoulder all the way from the front, the side, all the way to the back. Uh, right. So, so this is the principle of irradiation. So the hand grip, you know, I see these athletes coming in and they're all pumped up on you know what, and then they have these little kitten computer hands and someone forgot to train their hands. And I said, give me a break, son. You better start climbing a rope. Put a towel over that bar and start to get rid of all the handles and start gripping some fat things <laughs> and pull ropes and towels and all the rest of it and get a pair of mitts. So anyway, uh, uh, that that irradiation through the body not only comes distally to proximal, but it also comes proximal to distal. So if I, uh, again, you know, we, we would set you up on an arm wrestle uh, platform and we'd lock in the core and just with more core, more core, lock the elbow and then let the big joints just do the work. You don't even have to pull with your arm. Do you, do you see what I mean? That's a that's a proximal to distal form of um, don't let the weaker joint go into an eccentric contraction. Just dominate it with the concentrics through the big uh, power centers. But there's a few thoughts anyway. How do you guys test uh, the density of neural drive? You mentioned doing so with weights. Uh, can you give us a couple examples? Yes. Well, in the laboratory, we would use uh, EMG electromyography, and you're familiar with surface electrodes that you mm -hmm. stick onto the skin over muscles. Uh, we also did intramuscular EMG. I was one of the first guys in the world ever to have electrodes implanted into my quadratus lumborum, deep psoas, deep back muscles, uh, and that kind of thing. We, we did that work. I was a uh, visiting professor uh, for a year at the medical school in, in Switzerland, in the University of Bern, where we did that original intramuscular uh, work. And it was so interesting. Uh, three days a week, I worked at the uh, university. Uh, and two days a week, I worked at the Swiss uh, Olympic Training Center, their national training center. So I had uh, access to all the Swiss uh, Olympians uh, uh, etc. As great an athlete as they were, I would have all of them deadlift. I would be monitoring the back muscle activation. So, you know, someone will say, oh, well, I'm, I want to get strong. I'm going to do a deadlift. And I said, okay, well, what kind of strength are you looking for? Oh, I want back strength. And I, I usually at that point don't say too much unless they pull it out of me. But you can only activate your erector spinae to about 65, maybe 70% of neural drive. And you can be the world champ. And if you're doing it, 
good form, you're somewhere in that uh, region. You have to do other things to get 100% neural drive. So we measure the amplitude of that electromyographic signal, and uh, each one is a pulse. It is a pulse from the brain down the nerve. So it, it is a, a one-to-one measurement of the uh, density of uh, neural drive. So that's how we do it. And it's how we evaluate the, you know, the business I was describing earlier about how the brain organizes neuromuscular compartments, both within muscles and between muscles. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working on a project right now and, and basically, it's weight room barbell strength versus farm boy strength. So mm. carry a couple of uh, hay bales that are wet, you know, 100 pounds a piece uh, versus a couple of kettlebells, which have a very centralized mass uh, versus something that needs control because it's bouncing around a little bit. Or, you know, when we start using earthquake bars, uh, chains, uh, bands, you know, all the great things that I see going on at uh, your operation. So those kinds of things um, we measure through electromyography on their ability to transition into what we would call a farm boy strength. So there's no weaknesses. Pure barbell training can create and hide some weaknesses uh, 